Ministre, reprise le débat. The Honourable Member for Kootenay Columbia. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I will be sharing my time today with the member from South Okanagan, West Kootenay. I'm very pleased today to speak in favour of C-18, which will amend the Rouge National Urban Park Act, the Parks Canada Agency Act, and the Canada National Parks Act. And with the indulgence of the House, I'm going to dedicate my speech today to Parks Canada employee and volunteer extraordinaire Barry Campbell of Tofino, B.C., Barry devoted 45 years of his life to Pacific Rim National Park Reserve as a park naturalist, park warden, and a volunteer after he retired, pulling hundreds if not thousands of bags of invasive weeds from the park, and he died just after Christmas from cancer. He mentored me during my first parks job as a park naturalist, and I enjoyed it enough that I continued to make working with and for parks and the environment my career and my passion right up to date as the NDP critic or advocate for national parks. So thank you, Barry, for starting me on the path to a lifelong devotion to parks, and my sincere condolences to Barry's wife, Barb, and to his children, Michael and Ben, and their families. And while we're here today to talk about Rouge Park, I'd like to take a moment to put Rouge into perspective from both a historical and a system perspective. So Canada's national park system began in 1885, of course, with Banff National Park, so it's 132 years old. May 1911 was an important date as they established the first ever body to administer national parks. It was called the Dominion Parks Branch, which is now Parks Canada, and that was established in 1911. In 1930, the National Parks Act was created and first focused on preservation. There are currently 45 national parks, 46 with Rouge included. They cover every province, every territory. They represent a variety of landscapes and natural heritage. They currently cover just over 303,000 square kilometers, or about 3% of the total land area of Canada. 12 of our national parks are UNESCO World Heritage Sites, including Wood Buffalo, which is under investigation right now. There's a fair bit of concern whether Wood Buffalo should keep its status due to Site C Dam in British Columbia and the oil sands in Alberta. And the smallest national park is Georgian Bay Islands at 14 square kilometres. Rouge will be just 19 square kilometres, at least until it's increased. And the largest national park is Wood Buffalo at almost 45,000 square kilometres. So how are these parks currently doing? Well, if the most recent report was the State of Canada's Natural and Cultural Heritage, a uh, report from 2016, and they talk about the need for national parks to improve consultation with stakeholders when establishing parks uh, regarding ecological integrity. There has been progress made since 2011 when things were in really quite bad shape, but they now have 91% of the indicator ecosystems assessed. Regarding species at risk, the report states that many species continue to face threats from inside and outside heritage places. Habitats are disappearing at a rapid rate in many parts of Canada, and climate change can also affect biodiversity. And also of concern, the 2012 National Asset Review highlighted that over half of the agency's holdings were in poor or very poor condition and required investments in maintenance and rehabilitation. And that goes into parks' ecological indicators and some of the issues that are currently out there. So definitely needs to be some improvement in terms of the management of our existing parks as well. So another area where parks and protected areas is challenged in Canada is in meeting the Aichi targets signed onto by Canada. Canada has agreed to, by 2020, setting aside 17% of Canada's land as protected areas. We're currently at about 10%, and 10% of Canada's marine areas should be protected by 2020. We're currently at about 1%. So the Environment and Sustainable Development Committee is just completing a study on how to meet and perhaps exceed Aichi targets moving forward. And there are many ways that we can do that, including working with First Nations to create indigenous parks, uh, making sure that there is connectivity between parks and protected areas, uh, working in interdepartmentally within the federal government, so working together, working with provinces, territories, municipalities, non-government organizations, 
And there are many other recommendations, so stay tuned. There will be a great report coming to the uh, Parliament here shortly. But one of the recommendations is also to consider expanding the number of national urban parks, of course, of which Ruse is the first one. So why does Ruse deserve to be Canada's first national urban park? And why do we support the bill? Bill C-18 proposes amendments to the Ruse National Urban Park Act and these important amendments include making the maintenance or restoration of ecological integrity the first priority of the minister in all aspects of the management of the park and adding approximately 1,669 <coughs> hectares of federal lands to Rouge National Park. Bill C-18 also broadens Parks Canada ability to pay out funds from a new parks and historic sites account and that will help create new parks as well. And finally, Bill C-18 modifies the boundary of Wood Buffalo National Park in Alberta, uh, withdrawing 37 square kilometres to create the Garden River Indian Reserve, which is a long-time commitment around reconciliation. So there are three aspects to the park. So why is Rouge that important? First of all, is Rouge Park is one of the most biologically diverse areas in Canada including a, red, a rare Carolinian forest, 23 federally designated species at risk, and over 1,700 plants and animal species. It also provides the only ecological connection for wildlife between the Oak Ridges Moraine and Lake Ontario. It also includes many agricultural and culturally important resources, including a national historic site and one of Canada's oldest known Aboriginal historic sites and villages. Important as well is there's an active farming community that is now protected under the Park Act and it's really important to realize that uh, agricultural activities and conservation if done well can go hand in hand and Rouge Park will be a good model I think to demonstrate that. It's the first national park in an urban setting accessible by public transit, creates a model for other areas um, of protection in urban settings and approximately 20% of Canada's population lives within one hour of Rouge Park. These are all really important factors as to why it's important to protect Rouge. So in conclusion, Madam Speaker, we want to start recognize the hard work and dedication of all community members who have worked tirelessly to protect the existing parklands and to establish Rouge National Urban Park. We believe that future national park management for Rouge should do a number of things. It should clearly prioritize ecological health, ecological integrity and conservation, ensure that all activities that may affect the park undergo thorough environmental assessment. That's one of the challenges with that bike trail in Jasper. There's been no environmental assessment or community involvement. It should include a science-based management plan to provide for strong public and parliamentary oversight and which consider adding almost 10,000 acres to the park by adding federal lands currently set aside for an airport. We will continue to hold the Liberal government accountable to deliver a Rouge Park that truly can serve as a model for establishing a number of new urban national parks across Canada. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments. Questions et commentaires. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Government House Leader. Yes, sir, thank you, um, Madam Speaker. And I just want to pick up on a point the member made reference to, and that is to, to recognize, you know, today we're debating uh, C-18. And I think we do owe a great deal of appreciation to those individuals, many of the stakeholders. Like, uh, you know, we have uh, political leaders, but it's also important to recognize that there are very many community leaders mm -hmm. for all the right reasons understood and saw a, a vision and want to as much as possible advance uh, this national park, the, the Rouge. And uh, I think it is important that we do take a, a moment during the time in which we're, de we're debating this uh, bill as ultimately we're in third reading, it's only a question of time before it ultimately comes to an end, to recognize, acknowledge and express how much we do appreciate the efforts of all those individuals that go far beyond the elected offices that really helped in making this happen. I wonder if the member might want to continue to emphasize on that particular point. The Honourable Member for Kootenay, Columbia. Yes, I'd like to thank my colleague for the question and for his comments. I, I, what I like about Rouge Park is that it was built from the ground up. 
It was built by people that lived in the community, that had a concern, they had a vision, and they kept at it for a long, long time, many, many years, until they finally saw it realized. I also like the fact that it brings together uh, agriculture and conservation in a model adjacent to 20 million people, I believe it is, uh, not 20 million people, but millions of people that live close by, because people need to start to understand the importance of agriculture and how it benefits conservation. So this will be a great model for that as well. So it brings together some great principles. It also, of course, came about because of community involvement, uh, and that is necessary uh, to ensure the well-being and future of the park as well, because the more people that cared about it, the more people will be there to watch how it goes in the future. Questions and comments, questions and commentaires. The R member for Yellowhead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I was waiting for the Secretary of State to ask me this question earlier, but he didn't. So now I'm going to turn and ask it to my colleague on my left. But Madam Chair, through you, uh, the uh, Liberal member asked about uh, opening up the parks for Canada's 150th uh, birthday and uh, allowing all Canadians free access to our parks. And I just wanted to uh, ask the member, uh, he's a, a former park uh, supervisor, many years with the province of Alberta dealing with parks. But one of the impacts that I see on some of our major national parks by opening them up to the public is the demand on the park people that are working there and the demands on the infrastructure such as BAP for traffic and stuff like this. And I wonder if he could comment. I just wanted to add, around all our national parks around Canada, we have many seniors with very low incomes. And what he thinks about giving them free access all the time, not only in Canada 150 Berkeley. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Honourable Member for Kootenay, Columbia. There's several aspects to the question, and I guess I'll start with the basic question about free access to parks. Uh, I worked with BC Parks for many years and Manitoba Parks, and there was often an internal debate and discussion about whether parks are a social good, which means they should be free, or whether they have a business side to them, which means people should pay to enter them. My preference would actually be the government fund all park systems well enough that they don't need to charge a fee to get in. So I, I'm very interested to see what happens this year with the free access to national parks. I did raise this question with the Minister, and the Minister has said that every national park in Canada has been asked to produce a plan for this year on how they're going to deal with potential increased use, including Banff and Jasper. So look forward to seeing what those plans look like, and uh, hopefully national parks will be well prepared for free use this summer. We have time for a brief, a brief uh, question. Uh, the Honourable Member for Sandwich Gulf Islands. I'll try to be brief, Madam Speaker. I've been trying to get to the floor because I felt like screaming out in some of the Conservative commentary. Ecological integrity is not a new buzzword come up with by the Liberals. It's been essential since 1998 when the panel on ecological integrity reported. It's been embedded in the legislation for Parks Canada. And the only reason that they wouldn't put out fires in boreal driven boreal ecosystems is that those are fire driven ecosystems. And the Rouge Valley National Park is a Carolinian forest and not fire driven. Any comments from my knowledgeable colleague? A very brief response from the member from Kootenay, Columbia. Yes, uh, thank you to the honourable member. Absolutely, ecological integrity can be as small as a marsh. If you ask, ask Ducks Unlimited what are they trying to do in marshes, they're trying to restore the ecological integrity of a marsh. Mm -hmm. uh, riparian area, you can restore for ecological integrity. So it has really nothing to do with forest fires unless forest fires are an intricate part of maintaining ecological integrity in that particular landscape or ecosystem. But ecological integrity can be applied on a very small scale, as it will be in Rouge Park. Well, 